Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, so we're going to start our presentations now. Um, I know it's not everyone's here, but uh, we'll start early. You know, three people will start uh, coming in. Um, so today, uh, let's see. Yeah, today we're starting a little bit early. Uh, 30 minutes early. And we'll have two presentations. Uh, the first one will be EBI's Train Online, and the second one will be uh, about the European European Genome Phenome Archive. Um, so we'll be starting at 8.30 a.m. Pacific time uh, and end around 9.30 uh, Pacific time. So each presentation is going to be about 30 minutes each. Um, and the conferences will be recorded, so uh, Everyone can access them online once we process them. Uh, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please type it in the message box provided in the application. Also, uh, please try to mute your mic during the presentation to prevent any background noises. Uh, are there any questions before we begin our first presentation? Okay, so our first presentation will be presented by Richard Grandison. Uh, Richard received his bachelor's in zoology, uh, followed by a PhD in aging research uh, at the University uh, College in London. Um, he joined MOEBI in October 2013, where he's a scientific training officer for learning. Uh, he looks after the MOEBI's train online portal and is responsible for developing new online courses with scientific experts at EBI and beyond, and finding new ways to engage uh, users and develop Train Online. Today, he'll be presenting about Train Online, uh, which provides free courses on Europe's most widely used data resources created by experts at EBI and collaborating institutes. Without further ado, allow me to introduce Richard. Thanks very much, Vincent. Um, and you've definitely saved me a minute on my slide introduction, so thanks very much for that. Um, Hello, everybody. Um, as Vincent mentioned, uh, I'm Richard Granson, uh, Scientific Training Officer um, for eLearning. So as Vincent said, my pure focus is, is looking at um, ways to provide online training uh, to cover the large uh, database resources uh, that we have here at Envoy BI. So I'm just going to go on to slideshow. So I just, should just say this will be, give you an overview of Train Online. Um, so as due to my background being a biologist um, and e-learning specialist, uh, it won't really go into any uh, technical details, so I hope that's okay. Okay, so just a quick overview of my talk. I'm going to briefly mention about uh, training and e-learning at Envoy EBI. Um, then I'm going to talk about what Train Online is and, and kind of how we're doing in terms of analytics um, before moving on to a short uh, Train Online demo that I'm going to show you live on our website. Uh, and then finally, I'd like to wrap up the talk with some future plans and projects that I think you'd be interested in that we're working on. Okay, so why do we offer training at Envoy BI? Well, as many of you know, we have a lot of excellent databases, resources, and tools. Um, but it's one thing just creating those resources. Um, the key is to find ways to train users and how to use them, um, how, to ask, uh, how to ask the right questions that they need to do in research, and importantly, how to get the right answers. So we do this in, in three main ways. Uh, we firstly offer on-site training, so these are typically um, five-day courses covering an area such as uh, drug discovery or agriomics or integrative omics, uh, things like that. So they cover that sort of databases and also the bioinformatic conceptual aspects uh, throughout those courses. Um, we also offer off-site training. So um, basically an institute can contact us and request training uh, trainers to come over and teach on, on any given subject or, or any particular resource they like. Um, so we offer that part of things. And then the final part, which is what I solely focus on, is our online training. So I just wanted to show you a quick slide and, and cover a couple of these aspects of, of why the EBI would want to do e-learning. Um, most importantly, uh, we can reach out to a very large number of people. Um, we do get a lot of people from all over the world coming to our face-to-face -face training events, um, but it's, uh, we can offer, obviously reach out to a lot more people and from a lot of different audiences um, across, across the globe by offering online training. 
And the good thing about online training is you can access it anywhere, anytime. All you need is a computer. Um, it can be 3 o'clock in the morning and you can just take an online course if you like. Okay, so here's our homepage um, at the moment. Um, I'll come back to that later when I show you the demo. So the aim of Train Online when we created it back in July 2012 was to make people more confident users of our data resources. Uh, we're not really trying to make them into bioinformaticians, but we're trying to get them more confident knowing the sort of steps involved in, in, in sort of searching for data and submitting data as well. In terms of our audience, um, we have a range of uh, generalists and specialists. I would say generalists are, are definitely more common to train online. So these are often bench-based biologists, clinicians, um, etc. that probably don't have any bioinformatics background, um, but kind of need to use uh, some bioinformatics as part of their research projects. Uh, we do get specialists as well, so these might be bioinformaticians or, or developers who want to be able to access a specific resource, want to know how to use it or submit something. Um, it might be they're looking to uh, use an API, for example. Um, so we, so we offer, have a kind of wide range of audiences to cater for. Importantly, Train Online is completely free to use. Um, there's no need to register. You can just literally access the courses uh, straight away. Um, but I'll, as I'll show you in the demo, uh, there is a good reason that why you might want to register uh, with our system. We currently have uh, 53 courses. Um, these range from functional genomics, um, proteomics, through to chemical biology, um, and even literature. So there's quite a nice uh, spread of resources uh, across EBI and training courses that cover these. In terms of the types of courses we offer, um, there's actually five types. And these, this is really good for um, catering for different, uh, different people's needs. So it might be that you only have 15, 20 minutes to do some online learning. This is where quick tours will come into play. Uh, they're really 15 to 20 minute snapshots of what a resource um, is and what you can do with it. For a more in-depth uh, look through a resource, you can uh, see our tutorials. Um, so these are typically one to three hours to walk through and they will guide you through uh, the different phases of, say, searching for a gene or explaining what the information means, submitting data, so they're much more in-depth. We also offer conceptual courses, which are like introductory courses to a particular theme, such as uh, metabolomics, functional geno genomics, etc. Uh, video courses, so this was actually a way to try and get, bring together closer our face-to-face -face courses uh, with our online learning. We've actually gone and filmed some of our, some of our most popular face-to-face -face courses and turn them into online courses with sort of broken up videos. And finally, uh, what we've just started launching uh, this year is we've uh, started a webinar series using uh, GoToTraining, so very similar to GoToMeeting that we're using now. Um, and this is really sort of half an hour presentations on the different resources, I guess a bit like we're doing for these technical conferences, um, but also gives uh, our users an opportunity to ask questions with any problems they've been having with the resources. So I just want to say um, at the end of the slide that we've, um, when Trend Online was built, we kind of examined a range of different um, e-learning platforms and actually decided to use a bespoke e-learning module built in Drupal 6. Um, and I'll show you kind of how that work, how that looks uh, in a moment when I do the demo. We are actually going to be migrating to Drupal 7 later in the year, so ho hopefully that will bring some extra functionality along with it. Okay, so in terms of the impact of uh, Train Online at the EPI, um, you can see the graphic here, hopefully in front of your screens. Uh, we launched in July 2012, and you can see how much traffic has grown um, throughout the years, um, especially in the last year and a half or so. So we've actually had over 247,000 unique users to our site uh, since we launched, and they range from 209 different countries. And if you look at the sort of end of the graphic on the right-hand side, you'll see that we're currently averaging about 16 to 17,000 unique users per month, which I think is a really good um, number of people accessing our site. In terms of where people are coming from, um, I guess the usual sus suspects that you'll get in um, any sort of website, uh, USA, India, and China all in the top 10. But interestingly, we have UK and Germany also um, very high up, um, mainly because CBI is located in Hinkston in the UK. And also, EMBL, uh, the headquarters uh, of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, are um, located in Heidelberg in Germany. So now I just wanted to give you um, a short demo of Train Online. So I'm just going to click this link, which will take me through to uh, the website. Hopefully, you can all see that OK. So this is our Train Online homepage. Um, and as I mentioned, you don't have to log in or register uh, to be able to access the courses. Um, 
But if you do, you'll uh, be able to take our quizzes that we have. So we have several quizzes embedded in uh, particularly our tutorials and conceptual courses. Um, and you'll also be able to have access to our quarterly newsletter, which gives you sort of updates about new courses, ways to get involved in, in UX testing, uh, things like that. So I'm just going to log in uh, myself very quickly um, so I can show you the quizzes a bit later on. Okay, so when you come to the home page, um, there's two ways to navigate to courses. Um, firstly, you can filter uh, courses by topic. Um, so you, if you want to know what uh, training courses we have on a given topic, say chemical biology, you can just click on this link and it will show, show you the range of courses we have on that subject area. Alternatively, if you want to look at the full range of courses that we offer, you can just click on this course list button. And this gives you uh, a list of uh, I think three pages um, of all the different courses that we have. So when you reach this page, what you probably want to do um, is use these uh, filter buttons on the left-hand side. So as you can see, you can filter by um, topic. So you can look at ontologies, chemical biology, structures, um, etc. So courses that fall within those categories. Um, you can also at this stage filter by level, um, although it's quite difficult to interpret what a beginner and intermediate level actually mean because it sort of depends who you are. If you're a bioinformatician, um, a beginner is probably um, actually uh, an intermediate course by our standards. Also, as I mentioned, um, you can uh, navigate courses or filter courses by uh, duration. So if you've just got like half an hour to spend, you can just look at courses um, that take half an hour long. Um, I think our longest course um, is probably around 18 hours of learning. That's our video course on next generation sequencing, um, which is actually our most popular course by a long way. I think um, it makes up about 42% of our site visits, um, that course, a really popular course. And that was, something, that was one of the face-to-face -face courses that was filmed and turned into an online course. And finally, you can uh, filter by the different uh, categories of types of courses I mentioned, so just using um, these check, uh, check boxes here. So if we um, have a look at, through a couple of examples of courses, I'm going to firstly show you um, an introduction to metabolomics. So this is um, an example of a conceptual course or introductory course. And this is the course landing page. Um, so you have a bit of information uh, about who the author of the course is, um, the level, the time it takes, and the um, topic filters. Um, and then, importantly, you have the learning objectives um, below and some social media icons. So there's actually two ways you can navigate through our Train Online courses. You can either start from the beginning, clicking Start Course, and then you can just navigate through um, the different pages that we have here. Or if um, particularly useful for a very long tutorial or something, if there's a part of a course that you want to, to look at, you don't want to have to go through the whole course um, before reaching that point, you can simply use this uh, left navigation menu and be taken to um, the section that you want to um, access. So I just want to bring up, so um, there's two types of pages that Train Online's built on at the moment. Um, the, this is an example of a book page, our most common type of page, which is pretty much a standard HTML page. However, on the next uh, slide here, on the next page, um, we also have an example of a, a carousel page. So this is a really nice way of uh, collating um, a, kind of like a set of slides, really, so guiding you through a process that might be guiding through a submission process or um, perhaps even guiding you through in the, stage, the key stages uh, of a metabolomic study. So the idea is you can just click through the slides here um, and it brings, brings everything together very nicely. You might also um, notice that we have these little grey boxes, um, it's a little bit hard to see on the carousel pages, um, over words. Uh, and these are glossary terms that we've added to our glossary. So the idea is if you just um, hover over a glossary term, um, then you can just see a short description. Um, alternatively, you can actually click through um, and see a, uh, the full description uh, right here. And this is really important, especially considering that our audiences are sort of often general biologists or clinicians, we need to sort of um, explain the uh, lingo a bit more carefully. Okay, so that's an example of uh, a conceptual course. Um, I just want to show you very briefly a couple of other um, courses that we have, types of courses, um, and you'll be able to see the difference um, between quick tours and tutorials. And this is nicely um, seen here by this Uniproc quick tour. So this is, as I said, the 15 to 20 minute um, kind of what the resource does, what you can do with it, the sort of questions you can ask, um, 
and so it doesn't really go into detail about how to do the actual um, the actual searches or the actual submission. So if I just go back, um, and here's the full tutorial. And right away, if you look on the left-hand side, the navigation here, you'll see actually how much more in-depth um, this course is. And I think actually it took two people sort of around six months, not full-time, um, of, of actually building this course with me. So uh, much more in-depth course. Um, the other way this, this course differs um, is uh, we actually have exercises associated with it. Um, so these are really nice examples where, real-life examples, where you can actually go through, set an exercise for the students, uh, or trainees, um, in this example, asking you how you to find all human protein kinases in Uniprop with a 3D structure. Um, so what it does is it wants you to get you to actually use the resource, learn some of the theory and, and what you've learned through, throughout the course. Um, and if you have any difficulties, it gives you a little bit of a hint. Um, and then importantly, it has this nice step-by-step -step basis of how the curator or trainer would go through that process. So I'm just going to go to this um, how to use Uniprop tools. Um, this is actually our newest tutorial, and I think this is a really nice way of what we're trying to achieve with our online learning. We're actually trying to um, cater for different learning styles. So everybody has a, a different learning style. Some people like reading a lot of text. Some people like having screen annotated screenshots to explain ideas. Some people like figures. What, what we've done in the, this Uniprop course is we've kind of got a range of different things. And so you see here, you can nicely see a sort of a two-minute video which is a sort of Camtasia video uh, of going through how to use BLAST or how to do a BLAST search. Um, also with screenshots and, and step bars so you can actually try it out for yourself. So I think this is a really nice way of, of finding a range of different um, ways to interact with our, with our audiences. So as I mentioned, um, our tutorials and our conceptual courses um, typically have a quiz associated with them. Um, at the moment, the quiz questions are kind of limited to multiple choice, true or false, um, and scaling questions, um, and also sort of mapping one answer to another. Uh, we are looking at moving over to Drupal 7 um, later in the year, which will give us more flexibility, so we can add things like uh, drag or drop. Um, so the idea is you answer these questions, and they'll give you feedback straight away on the questions. Um, you can also take the quizzes as many times as you want. So. Um, if you've struggled in the first quiz, for example, you can go through the course again and um, it will record your latest score um, in that quiz. Okay, so that's um, what I wanted to talk about in terms of my uh, demo of Trendline. Um, just finally, if I go back to my slides, um, just resume the slideshow. A couple of new projects that are going on at the moment. Uh, one of the things that's happening probably in the next month or so is we, we're going to be revamping our training pages. We've just launched a, a new events database that's pulling all the information through for our face-to-face uh, -face events. Um, so we are building some new uh, training pages for that. Um, but later in the year, we're hoping to uh, develop, redevelop the train online pages, making them a bit more user-friendly, sort of bringing the courses much more to the focal point. Um, um, hopefully that's going to happen. Uh, a little bit later in the year, the sort of key thing is having the web development time. I mean, all the wireframes and mock-ups are already in place. And so it's just getting development time for that. Uh, the second project that I think a lot of you would be very interested in is uh, this Modular Trainings Partnerships uh, project. So this is a, uh, some funding we got from the BBSRC, BBSRC sorry, uh, in the UK for three years of funding to work with industry to basically um, better equip their, their scientists um, in the workplaces with the bioinformatics skills they need to answer, uh, basically answer questions in their research projects. So these are typically discovery biologists um, coming from three key areas, pharma, consumer, consumer goods, and agri-food. And what we're trying to do um, through this approach is to actually develop workflows um, to structure their learning. So I'm going to show you an example of how the workflow might look um, in the next slide. In terms of other things uh, specifically for this project, we're looking to add discussion groups. Um, again, this is going to be tailored just for the MTP audience um, initially. Um, we're also going to offer the ability to track progress throughout a workflow and um, where you left off in a course. So at the moment, uh, the one uh, restriction on Train Online is we can't uh, have a way of the user going back to where they were in, the, um, in a course when they left it. So the ad addition of functionality to this will allow us to try this out, certainly initially with the MTP trainees. And as I mentioned, we're looking to add more advanced quizzes um, when we migrate to Drupal 7. 
So this is just an example um, of a workflow. Um, so the idea is they'll see this interface of blue boxes and they'll work their way through different, a series of different questions. Um, so this is the first generic workflow they'll take. They'll also be given two workflows uh, that are more tailored for their specific area, such as pharma, for example. And um, basically, the a series of questions will be asked, um, and what they'll do is they'll click through to on one of these and be taken to kind of a one-page overview uh, with learning objectives for that section. Um, and then they'll be given a list of uh, resources, training, online training courses, both from Train Online and any good external ones we found. Um, videos, webinars, uh, things like that, case studies. So what we're doing is really creating a package in terms of learning, um, and this is a very new thing for us, so we're really excited about how this is going to go down, and hopefully we're going to be able to roll out something very similar to other Train Online users um, once we've started just uh, got into this project. So that just leads me to um, a few acknowledgements. Um, here's the training team on, on the left-hand side of the slide, um, which I'm part of. And I'd also like to thank um, our funders um, for funding our projects across the training team. So thanks very much for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, thanks, Richard. That was uh, really helpful. Um, so I, I have a question. Uh, let's, let's say for part of this uh, B2K project, um, our group at UCLA or a group at Scripps wants to uh, come up with training modules for our own resources, and um, what, what, what's that, that pro the process like um, uh, to come up with to come up with new train modules, and, and how, how easy is that for people to do, and uh, how could you make that available to people who are outside of EBI? Um, that's a very good question. So uh, it, it kind of depends on the type, length of the module. The quick tours can pretty much be done within, you know, with people working full time on other things. Probably done in, in one to two months. Actually, Gary, I think, um, did a quick tour for um, EGA. I think it was, and uh, he can tell you a bit more about that. Maybe of how long it took for for him. But it's those sort of courses. As they only take 15, 20 minutes. That are quite quick to build. Um, in terms of the tutorials. Um, you know, they, they are a lot, lot more sort of thinking goes into those um, different exercise, designing different exercises, maybe doing some videos, etc. Um, so that you know that can take somewhere between three to six months. Um, you know, doing all the testing and, and things like that, getting it approved internally before we can then go out and, and pull it live to to people outside the EBI. Okay. Uh, thank you. But just to follow up on, just. To uh, this is Andrew Sue here. Just to follow up on that last comment, I mean, is it within the scope of the EBI online training to host training modules for tools outside the EBI tool set? <laughs> that's a very good question. Um, it's not something we have done yet. Um, that's not to say it's something we would we, we would rule out straight away. I think that's definitely something we'd like to think about. Um, we are working a lot with other sites who are, um, so Alexia UK, for example, are creating a test site, which is sort of a um, an aggregate of training materials across different platforms. Um, so we'd probably not host the materials ourselves. They'd probably go onto a site like a, like this test site from Elixir, um, because that's kind of a better place to aggregate um, different areas. Um, but that's an interesting thought as well. I mean, there is one course you'll see on Train Online, which is um, International Mouse Phenotyping Consortium Tutorial. Um, that's technically not an EBI project. Um, it's not a resort, EBI resource, but EBI part of that collaboration. So uh, we we host those kind of resources there as well. Um, other projects such as Biomed Bridges uh, resources will also go there. So they're not standard EBI resources, but they are something that we've been involved in, in working on. Uh, so, so, that, that so that was sort of my assumption. Go ahead. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, so, so like that course, like the mouse phenotyping, did you develop that, or did your your partner develop that? Uh, so, actually, they they um, didn't have any time. So, um, I I spoke to one of the guys working on the project here, and I actually wrote that course um, on my own from from scratch, which I don't normally do because obviously I'm not the subject matter expert. I'd like to work with those people to develop the courses so they've got the content. But with, with that course, it was quite good. I'd watched some webinars and things like that. Um, I'd spoken a lot to, to the expert, and then I went and built the course. Um, I think that one actually took a month, but I spent quite a lot of time um, on that. So. Right, thanks. Excellent. So um, another follow-up uh, from Andrew. So um, 
like I was assuming that was going to be the case where EBI training would be would be focused on EBI tools. But having said that, right, the infrastructure you've developed is quite nice, right? Yep. Both in terms of uh, browsing and tagging and rating the different courses, and presumably there's um, some back-end authoring tools and things like that. Um, you know, and that is is certainly generalizable, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess what I'm driving at is, you know, rather than, um, I, I don't know, not polluting, but <laughs> incorporating, uh, you know, non-EBI related things into the EBI training side, I mean, how about then making sort of a, uh, either open sourcing the software or uh, making sort of a community version mm -hmm. um, where almost anybody in the community can, um, can contribute and author training tools, mm -hmm. and then you know, and then and then just um, you know, let the the popular ones bubble to the top, and there'll be a lot of ones that are probably aren't very good, and nobody will view them. But you know, it would be a really nice, it might be a really nice resource for just tr training in general. I de definitely agree with that. Um, actually, in my last job, uh, working at the Royal Society of Chemistry, um, we had the resources that we produced ourselves, but then we also um, had sort of approved by RSE resources, um, which are basically third-party resources that we thought were of a good enough standard to include uh, within our website. And you know, the pr producers of that were very happy to have it on a website because uh, we're getting a lot of hits um, every day. Um, what I would say is um, there are sites that kind of do that. There's one called Goblet that you might want to look at that is, is basically a sort of community-driven um, aggregator of, of the best sort of resources in bioinformatics. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's kind of trying to not to step on the toes of other people, um, but certainly an interesting idea, you know, with the volume of hits that we're getting to our site, whether we might want to do that in the future. Um, Great, that's a that's a great idea. So I think we should definitely check out Goblet. I w one other question for you. So so you know, not many organizations have a dedicated team of you know whatever it was twelve or or so training experts. Um, and you know, as you alluded to, right, it also takes uh, an investment of time by the domain experts too. Yes, exactly. Um, that is a, a, probably a luxury of you know, is not a, an, an investment in training that most grants um, have, right? So, so, for example, even our BD2K, which has a substantial training component, most of that is towards sort of the hands-on training of individuals, I think, yeah. um, or a substantial component of that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know the balance between that and, and sort of uh, long-term training resources like you'd find on the web. So, anyway... Um, a any thoughts on ways to motivate or, or, or other organizations that fund this type of training um, activity or whether there was an even a thought where, you know, you guys would be a clearinghouse, again, to take some of the popular community contributed ones and really, you know, make them really good? Yeah, I'm, I mean, so, so just coming back to a previous question, I guess to answer a bit of that question, um, I would say that uh, our face-to-face -face training um, sessions are, don't just cover e EBI resources. Obviously, we're the experts at EBI resources um, here, um, but there are other resources that they do cover, you know, the popular ones uh, within the five-day courses. Um, we don't do it so much online. However, having said that, with the uh, modular training partnership project um, that I showed you, that is uh, an example where we are linking out to um, sort of good quality tutorials. So, for example, Cytoscape, uh, for example, we're not going to develop our own online course of that because there's really good tutorials um, out there. Um, to answer your second part of your question, in terms of motivating, I guess it's 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 quite. I, I'd say it's obviously a bit easier here because one of our one of the missions, uh, core missions of the EBI, is training. Um, and although people don't really have it worked into into their contracts that they need to spend, well, certainly most people, most of our trainers don't. They sort of do it as a sort of goodwill and, that you know, they want to, to de personally develop. Um, yeah, I would say that's probably the angle to play it on is, is to try and, you know, get people involved. It's, it's always good for developing your skills to, to be involved in training. Um, we do, I, I think, I can't remember the number, we've probably had three or four hundred people training in our organization at some point over the last few years. So there are quite a lot of people that are interested um, um, but it's not necessarily factored into their, to their initial time um, 
so yeah, I don't really, I unfortunately, don't have a, a perfect solution for motivating people to be involved in training. I think it, yeah, it helps having a dedicated training team. Um, from the picture of the 11 people, um, so about three or four of those are invo involved in actually running the events, so organizing sort of the administration, the accommodation, things like that. We have uh, Mark, uh, Mark here who's involved in audio-visual, so we have um, virtual machines in our training room, so he's involved in, in setting those up, uh, rolling out disk images for that. Um, and then we have two scientific training officers, um, Tom and Laura, who actually just look after the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, workshops uh, and courses and also some of the um, external things that looked after. But as you said, there's, a, there's lots of buy-in still from, from people across the organization um, to do that. Part of that might be, funny, might be because it's written into their grants, but also part of it's for, for sort of developing themselves as well and, and trying to promote the resources they're working on really. Thanks a lot. Great stuff. No problem. Are there any other questions for uh, Richard? Okay. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, that was yeah, thanks very much. Um, all right. So uh, we'll move on to our second presentation. So uh, first we'll give uh, presentation access to, to Gary. All right, so Gary, you should be getting a prompt. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, now we see your screen. Uh, yeah, power. Okay. Yeah, try, try to display the, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's nice. good. All right, so, uh, so our second presentation will be presented by Gary Saunders. Uh, Gary received his undergraduate degree in genetics and uh, his PhD at the University of Glasgow, Glasgow. Um, at MOEBI, uh, Gary is responsible for the scientific content of the European Variation Archive, the Database of Genomics Variance Archive, and the European Genome Phenome Archive. Uh, Gary works to ensure the data available from each of these resources is accurate, clear, and easily discoverable. And today he'll be presenting about the European uh, Genome Phenome Archive which allows you to explore data sets from genomic studies provided by a range of data providers. Uh, without further ado, allow me to introduce Gary. Thank you. So, as was said, I'll lead you through a presentation about EGA at EBI. The first thing about the EGA is that it's a controlled access database. So, at the start of this presentation, I'll explain exactly what that controlled access means. Then we'll discuss what data we house, how you access these data, and how you grant permission to the data sets at EGA, and I'll finish off on some new features that we have. So here in this slide, I'm showing the five classical archives at EBI and the data that they host. So at the top, we have ENA for sequence data, Array Express for array data, EVA for variation data, Biosamples describes all about phenotypes, and the DGVA is for structural variations. Now, each of these is a fully open and public archive, so that means that you submit your data and anyone can download it once it's been processed on our side. If any data has to be submitted to EBI that's for controlled access, that's when it goes to the European Genome Phenome Archive. So we launched EGA in 2008, and the strap line of our resource is that we are a secure archive for the controlled distribution of phenotypic and geno uh, genotypic data. When we launched, we had two flagship studies. The first is here on the left-hand side, and that's the Wellcome Trust Case Control Consortium, a GWAS analysis of seven diseases that looked at 14,000 cases and 3,000 controls. And on the right-hand side, we have the Cancer Genome Project, and this was led by Andy Fatrio when he was here at the Sanger Institute. Both of these studies are among our oldest, but they're still among the most commonly shared data sets that we have. Since then, 
We have over 6,000 data access accounts. 220 of them are submission only. We have a total of 1.6 petabytes in our archive, and that covers roughly 1,200 data sets. We have last year alone distributed 420 terabytes of data. We have two full-time employees at the help desk, and those guys deal with an excess of 200 contacts per month, so that's 200 individual emails. And it's important to stress that since 2012, EGA is a joint venture between the CRG in Barcelona and the EGA at EBI. So that's a joining of the Alexia Spanish and UK nodes. So the majority of data that we host at EGA is generated by consortia. And here is a number of logos for things like ICGC, the Sanger Institute, RD Connect, Cancer Research UK. And the decision these people have made is to use EGA as the primary archive and distribution model for their data. Another way to look at the data that we have in EGA is by phenotype and experimental type. So on the left hand side we're looking at phenotypes for the studies. On the different colored bars we're looking for um, experimental type. The bottom one on its own is cancer others and the six above that are other types of cancer. If we lay them end to end then cancer data represents about two-thirds of the data we have in EGA. In terms of experimental type, it's the light blue bar that's the most common, and that represents whole genome sequencing, and these are the newest data sets that we have. We can look at the EGA submitter demographics, and here this map, every blue dot on this map represents an individual submitter. We represent uh, we serve over 220 institutes worldwide. Submissions range from single publications right through to large projects. Notably here I've put on the yellow dots, this is ICGC. ICGC funds a number of different labs across the world to investigate 50 different tumor types. All of the data from ICGC goes through EGA. The other yellow dot on this page is here, and that's in the UK in Cambridge. That represents the Sangen Institute on our campus, and Sangen Institute itself, from a number of different projects, represents about 80% of the data that we have in EGA. If we look at the EGA data growth in 2010, then this bar chart at the start represents the classical growth of an archive. Throughout 2010 and 2011, we were going out soliciting submissions looking at publications, trying to pull data in, so it represents a slow growth. Then around about 2012, you can see that the accumulated data in the red takes off. This is where people know about the EGA and start to come to us for submissions. And this rate of increase is what we see all the way up to where we are, with a peak in the early part of 2014, where we start to in, in, increase the size of the blue bars. Now, the blue bars indicate the size of terabytes data per, submitted per month, and that's when we get things like the, the next generation sequencing technologies, and most things are whole genome sequencing. So what types of data and file formats exactly do we support at EGA? So the three main data types are sequence data, array-based data, and phenotypic data. The exact file formats for the sequence data, we take the raw and unaligned reads. So that's usually BAMs, CRAMs, or fast queues. We take the aligned BAM reads and the analysis of those aligned BAM reads in the VCF format. So VCF files themselves are among the smallest files, but when we look at the single most commonly shared file type from EGA, it's the VCF file. For array-based data, we take the raw files again, which is cells in this case, the intensity files, the IDATs, analysis files are PLINKS and WTCCC. For phenotypes, we accept phenotypic data in all file formats. Most commonly, this comes to EGA as spreadsheets or text files. So once someone has decided to submit their data to EGA, exactly how does this work and what are the processes? So the first thing is that there's the completion of a submission statement. 
The EGA submission statement for each submission account achieves three things. The first is that it specifies the controlled requirements for the data. What do we mean by that? So the data passwords, for example, how can they be shared? Can they be emailed? Have to have to, to be explained over the telephone? Can they be posted? Do they have to be faxed? The second thing that the EGA submission statement should accomplish is that it adheres to the local laws and ethical regulations. They go put through quite a lot of processing to ensure that's the case. The third and final thing is that they reference all individuals authorised for the account. What do I mean by that? It's that the people on the document are those that can grant access to other users for the EGA data set. So once you have your, your EGA account, that gives you your username that you can log in to the data uploader. The data uploader itself is a standalone Java program. Once you put in your username and password, you log in. Once you log in, you select the folder in which you want to look for the files you want to upload to EGA. It's a simple checkbox. So once you check the boxes of the files that you want to upload, you simply hit encrypt and upload, and that generates a data set at EGA. So once the data is in EGA, how do the users find out about this data? A classical example is through publication. This leukemia paper was submitted to Nature, and Nature went back to the user and said, you have to share your data in order for us to publish this paper. When the user looked at the samples, this is the, they stipulate that they must be maintained under controlled access, and Nature advises users to submit their data to EGA when it has to be maintained within controlled access. So throughout the publication procedure, these data were archived, allowing the author to put in the accession number um, on their publication. Anyone that reads the paper can go to EGA, use this accession number, and find the data. The second way is through Consortia's own website. So as I was saying, a large proportion of the data within EGA comes from different consortia. Consortia often, they often have their own website. Here's an example of UK10K. And there is highlighted in yellow here a link to where you can find the UK10K at EGA. The third way to find data at EGA is through using the EGA website itself. Here's our home page. At the top, we have a number of different tabs. A lot of these tabs are dedicated to documenting the controlled access procedure, how we archive the data, and how it's shared. For this part of the presentation, we're looking here at the search box. When we focus in on that, it's a, it's a simple text box where you put in any term that you want, and you have a drop-down box to specify if you want to search against the whole website only studies, only data sets, or DAC. We put in the accession from the paper that I was showing earlier. It takes you straight to a search result that highlights the study in question. And when you follow that link, you're greeted with the study page. Each individual study page describes the data sets within the study. Importantly, data sets can belong to one or more studies but every single study has at least one data set, and it's the data set at which, the level at which users are granted access to data and what the DACs cover. So when you look at an individual data set page, you can see on the right-hand side here who controls the data, and it has some access information. So once you hit the link, it shows you exactly how to apply for access to these data. So how does this distribution model work? So we've got the classical user that comes to the EGA website and identifies one or more data sets that they want to grant, uh, they want to be permitted access to. In this case, I've used DAC, uh, data sets that are covered by two distinct DACs. The first one is malaria gen. The second is the WTCCC. So the user in question then completes the application form. And how does that work? So they download the application form, and they're technically asked three main questions. Their name and affiliations, the project that they work on, and exactly what they plan to do with the data once they're permitted access. 
another part of every single application form is that it, um, it highlights the rules that one must adhere to in order to access the data. So once the application form has been sent off, how does this look to the DAC? So we provide DAC admin tools for every single DAC so that they can log into a website, see outstanding applications, simply check the boxes that they want to grant access to, and this in turn grants on this page that you can see every single user and what data set they have been granted access to. Once this part happens, these decisions are fed back to EGA and we generate a personal EGA user account that allows an individual to log into the EGA website and download the data. That's what's represented by these folders here. So to talk some more about the EGA user account, it's personal and exclusive for use only for the registered user. This is something we police quite severely and we have to do so due to the sensitive nature of the data. An EGA user account allows the user to access the web account. From the web, they can generate requests for downloading data. They use the EGA user account to access the download client that I'll show you in a second. And they're able to generate custom FTP and Aspira downloads. So here I'm showing what the website looks in when I what look what it looks like when a user is logged in. So you go to the data set page and this time there's no need to apply for access again because you can see more information about the data set. You can see exactly what data is within it. You use the check boxes to request the selected packages. Once you select the, select the files that you want to download, you're greeted with this um, page that says your request has been noted and it will be available via the EGA downloader within an hour. So the EGA secure download client is a separate standalone Java client. Once you download, and this uh, works from both command line and GUI, I'm showing the GUI here. So you use your username and your password and you log in. Once you log in, you select, you put in a local encryption key. So when you download data from EGA, they come down as double encrypted files. They're encrypted in terms of how we've zipped them at EGA, but they're also encrypted as they're streamed to the user using this local encryption key. This is anything you want to put in. You select the download directory for where you want to put the encrypted files. You use this drop-down menu here to either select a data set that you have access to or a request that you've made. Once you see the data set, you can, this is where you see the level of the individual files. You can select one or more files. You simply start the download, and you're given a progress bar to see when it will complete. Now, as I said, files come down double encrypted, so you have to decrypt them once they're, once they're downloaded. This also happens within the EGA secure download client. At the top here, we have three distinct tabs. This one we're on now is for decrypting the files. You look in the folder where you've downloaded the encrypted files. You select the directory where you want to place the unencrypted files. You use the local encryption key that you used when you downloaded the files, and you simply press decrypt. Once you're doing that, that's when the files are decrypted and ready to be used. So that's a bit of a one-on-one through the EGA and how it works. Upcoming developments, in the short to medium term, we've tried to streamline the application procedure. You can see through this presentation that it's, it's convoluted, it's different for each individual DAC. It's a bit of a black box process. I'll explain more about this in a second. We've also tried to improve our download um, capabilities for the user, so we've got a new streaming service. In the longer term, we want to offer BAM splicing. So one of the most common feedbacks we have to EGA is that you have to download a huge number, a huge volume of data, a number of gigabytes, even if you're only looking at, say, certain loci or pathways of interest. So we want to permit the user to be, to be able to splice the BAM file by chromosomal location and only download the regions that are of most interest. The second point here is linked to that, so we want to offer a, a genome browser 
on the cloud. So you would have been granted access to a data set. You log into the cloud. You can use the genome browser to see the data sets that you have access to. And therefore, you can choose whether to download these data or download part of a data set or perhaps only BAMP files for certain samples. With regard to streaming the online application procedure, REMS stands for Resource Entitlement Management System. And as I was saying, we're looking to offer a transparent interface between the applicant and the participating DAC. So the feedback we have is that the application procedure currently is a bit of a black box. You complete your application form, email it off or fax it off, but you're never entirely sure if it's been read, where you are in the application procedure, um, or, or, or when you can expect to reply. So the full application procedure for REMS is conducted within REMS itself. Importantly, EGA remains completely passive in the application process. EGA never grants access to a data set from a user that only ever comes from the DAC. This is an Elixir funded project, but how does it look? So here we have the, red, the, the data set page again. On the right hand side, you can still see who controls access to these data, but instead of having an application form, you have a link that says apply for permission. Once you press the apply for permission, that takes you to the third party REM software completely still online. You're asked the same questions, so what are your personal details and your affiliations, the project that you work for, what you exactly plan to do with the data. You then upload your documents like um, the research plan that you have and submit your application. You can track all the applications that you've submitted, but one of the best features about it is that you have a history tab so you can see when the application was created. You can see that someone's read the, proceed the application, it's waiting for approval, it's been approved, and you can also use this page to ask the DAC questions. So in this case, the user's asked, can you update me on the progress of this particular application? On the DAC side, they simply log into REMS and they can see all outstanding applications and they can choose whether to approve, reject, or um, look at any application in particular. Once a DAC approves an application through REMS, again completely online, that automatically generates an EGA user account, so there's no need for EGA to, to be notified and generate this ourselves and the user is notified by an email. The second major improvement that we have is the new distribution service. So the current EGA download client that I showed you, the Java standalone client, is very good. However, it's network and firewall dependent. So earlier when I said that we work with a couple of hundred institutes, these usually have, um, diff well, they have different firewalls that have different strengths. So in some cases, it's just not possible to adhere to the firewall dependencies. And this means that we have to generate download accounts for these institutes or these users manually. So the help desk guys do this, but it's a really time-consuming process. So the new download client is based on this microservices architecture and it's HTTP based, so it removes the need for firewall or server um, restrictions. It basically means that if you can get an HTTPS web page, you can use this new client. It's integrated into the EGA website. So what do I mean by that? Currently, when you, um, when you have to use a standalone client, you have to flip between two windows. With the new client and with REMS, everything is within the website. So when you log in, you have a My Data tab, and you can look at the data set that you have, up, you have um, granted access for. You can then download these data or look at them in the cloud, as I was saying. You can then um, download the data from straight within the website. That's the important point. So where are we with this distribution service? We're at the advanced stages of testing. At the last count, I think we'd sent it out to about um, between 20, I think it was 25 to 30 users, 
But the important point is that no file has failed to be downloaded. No file that's been started has failed at all. So I'll summarize there, and I've taken you through an introduction to the EGA, which is the EBI's Controlled Access Archive. We're a joint venture between Alexia UK and Spain. EGA is the largest archive at EBI in terms of total data. We've got a new application procedure, REMS, which is completely online and is transparent. The new download client is HTTP based and is a lot faster. So these are the people that I work with and I'll give my thanks to all of them and I'll stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. So this is Andrew, I'll start with a question, I guess. Um, so one of the things that um, I think the EBI does really well with respect to its uh, data repositories, right, Array Express in particular is the one that I, I use a lot, um, is the sample metadata, right, defining the metadata in ways that can facilitate comparisons. Um, and, um, and, and so I was wanted, wondering about, you know, your comment where the phenotype data would be taken in essentially any format. Excel or text file, you know, does that go under any curatorial review to standardize it according to ontologies and just sort of general you know, making that more structured data? At the moment, not really, but there is a project that we've just started to use the experimental factor ontology as the primary ontology to describe our phenotypes. So this is related to another project that we work on, CTTV. And the whole goal is that all resources at EBI, so that's Array Express and all the other archives, will map the submitted phenotypes to EFO. So we're starting to see the coverage increase at the moment. We're about 60%, but the global goal is that we would map to EFO. So that would be across all, all the data repositories at EBI? Exactly. So we're, we're pushing this from the um, EGA and EVA perspective. Ensemble will start to show EFO ontology uh, terms soon. And when you when you submit to Array Express, there is now um, the, the, the way that you submit your data to Array Express is tuned completely into EFO. So if you suggest a phenotype and it does have an EFO mapping, it will ask you, would you rather use this term? We hope you would say yes. And then this, this kind of future proofs us so that it's not a constant cleanup operation. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Hi, uh, this is Vincent. Uh, I have a question. So, do you know uh, what specifically uh, you guys, the, the mechanism, mechanism you guys use to to download and uh, or for the streaming service? So, you, you mentioned it was a HTTP protocol. Um, mm -hmm. You know what uh, specifically? Um, I don't. I'm sorry. I, what What would you mean? So, we have um, HT. What port? It's the port 8102. Um, is that what you're referring to, or what protocol? Uh, yeah. So, do you guys also do you guys use uh, Aspera uh, currently? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we we offer Aspera for custom downloads at the moment. The plan is that um, the new client will offer Aspera as well. It's so much faster. We have been testing with our partners at CRG but we're about two or three weeks away from offering the new download client to use this beta. Oh, okay. I see. Are there any other questions for Gary?
Okay. Uh, if not, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, that was a great presentation. It was very helpful. Um, are there any other general questions uh, regarding uh, the conferences or about the BD2K? Okay, if not, uh, we'll end our conference uh, here. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, we'll be uploading the, the recordings uh, later today. Um, if, if you have any questions, feel free to email us. Um, but for now, we'll, uh, for, about, for the next hour, we'll, uh, we'll be online for open discussions or questions. And there's the uh, link to the YouTube channel if you didn't get it last week, so there you can find all of the recordings. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.